we have reached a major transition point in the book of Revelation. There's not very many of those. Revelation, as we get to chapter 6 especially, just kind of unfolds in an unbroken line. But uh, we, we have come to the prophetic portion, but we haven't quite come to the end times portion yet, if you know what I mean. And sometimes that can be frustrating for folks because they're like, talk about the Antichrist, you know, get to the good stuff, get to the things that I want to talk about. And it's, it's funny, all the books that I have about Revelation that I read and I study, you know, the sections on chapters one through five are maybe about this big, and then all the rest of it is like this huge. And there are certainly more questions to be answered there. But I hope that that doesn't reflect in our heart how much we value these early chapters of Revelation, right? Because we've already looked at the seven churches. We looked at the description of Christ in chapter one. And then in chapters four and five, we're going to have visions of heaven, And it's good to be curious and desire to know more about what's going to happen at the end because Christ has revealed it to us. But you cannot miss the way that Jesus frames this prophecy of the end times. It starts and ends with a vision of God and Christ glorified in heaven or in the new heaven, as we're going to see at the very end. And we can't skip over this, so we won't. In fact, John's vision of the throne room of God is going to cover two chapters which ought to arrest our attention a little bit. We don't want to blow through these things. Not only because it's in there and so it matters, but because if we're going to talk about the end of the world, which is not always a nice thing to discuss, we're going to be reading about uh, those that will believe in Jesus during that time, getting their heads cut off and being chased from the face of the earth. It's, It's not going to be happiness, really. So what is going to carry them through? And what's going to carry us through as we go through our lives? We're not here yet. We're not in heaven yet. So what allows us, enables us to keep going? It's our eternal destiny in Christ. And Revelation 4, even more so than chapter 5, exists to put us in our place. I'm about to talk about what's going to happen at the end of the world. Let's get one thing straight. Who's the boss? And God's going to say, I'm the boss. We are creatures in the presence of our Creator. And we are driven to worship by even the faintest glimpse of His glory. And that's what this is going to be about. There's a lot of fun things to discuss today. There's a little theology in here. There's a little interesting Bible study that I I hope you will enjoy. And there's a great application at the end to worship the Lord. And so I'm very eager to get into this. It's only 11 verses, so we'll be able to take our time and go nice and slow. Let's start with verse 1. After this... I want to underline that. It's more significant than it looks at first. After this, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. So there it is again, after this. And this marks that transition that I described, after this. And after what is the question, not Not that complicated at first here. We just looked in chapter 1 of John's vision of Jesus glorified. And Jesus was John's best friend. But when he saw him glorified, he fell on his feet like he was dead. And then in chapter 2 and 3, we had visions of the, or letters, I should say, from Jesus to seven different churches. Jesus dictating epistles to the apostle John. And we spent a week going over each one of those. And this reminds us of the the outline, you might call it, that Jesus gave to John back in chapter 1, verse 19. When Jesus appeared to John on the island of Patmos, he said, Write, therefore, the things you have seen, the things that are, and those that are to take place after this. So you can see that he's saying, write down past, present, future. What you have seen, what's happening right now, and what's going to happen after this. There's those two words again. Now, what had he seen? He had seen that vision of the glorified Christ. He says, what you just saw with the lampstands and the seven stars, write all that down. Also write down the things that are. I'm going to give you seven letters that apply to the churches that are living right now. That's the present aspect. And the things that will be after this, that's the future aspect. I don't see how you can arrive at a place that does not believe the book of Revelation is talking about the future. And you might say, well, who thinks that? And you'd be surprised. There's a lot of folks that think that. That all this has already happened or that it doesn't describe anything specific. Certainly not the end of the world. And that seems to be exactly what the book of Revelation is describing. So that's what we're talking about. After this within the letter, 
After this, meaning we're about to look towards the future. But I believe, and this is a, a difference of opinion between different schools of thought, but I'm, I'm convinced of this one. I believe that the fact he repeats after this twice is indicating that something deeper is going on here. If the seven letters within the book of Revelation represent church history, it doesn't mean they necessarily apply to each age of church history, if just symbolically this description of the churches represents the church age, then this verse would apply to the rapture. The rapture. You've heard that word before. You might know what it means. If not, I'm going to tell you what it means today. The rapture is something the Bible talks about in several different passages. We'll read one of them in a second. Where the saints of God, the Christians, will be caught up. That's what the word rapture means. It comes from the Latin and it means to snatch or to grab something. Okay, To be caught up. That's why if you say, oh, I was, I was in rapture. Like I was caught up in the moment. Well, it comes from the word that means to catch away or to catch up. And we believe that is going to happen. The Bible describes it, that there will be a day when all of God's people will be caught up into the air to be with the Lord, it says. We believe, because all the other passages say, that there will be a trumpet that blows, which is, he says, there's a voice like a trumpet there, which I think is interesting. And it's going to call us to essentially do what that voice says, which is to come up here. Come on up here, y'all. That's how Jesus is going to say it. That's what the Greek literally says. It says, y'all... And we will be caught up to heaven. That's what we call the rapture, the catching up. Now, let me read to you from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He describes it much better than I could. He says, This we declare to you by a word from the Lord. We who are alive, so they're not dead people, these are alive people, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep, who have died, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. That's what we have in Revelation 4, verse 1. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together. That's that word, harpazo in Greek, rapture in Latin. Together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. That's the description of the rapture, that there will be a time when Jesus calls up all of his Christians alive and dead. It seems that those that have already died and are in the presence of the Lord, their bodies will be raised and glorified in that moment to meet God in the air, in heaven, right? Now, what is debated about this is not whether it's going to happen. What's debated is when is it going to happen? And this is a very legitimate discussion to have. I think it's indisputable that this will happen at some point. 1 Corinthians 15 talks about in a twinkling of an eye, we'll all be changed, right? John 14, verses 2 and 3. I go to prepare a place for you, and I will take you to be with me always. And the debate is, okay, when? And without getting into all of this, we've done it before, we at, at Calvary Chapel are what is called a pre-tribulational rapture view. That's a big word. Let's just break it down. Pre means before. You're not stupid. You get that, right? Tribulation means a hard time. What we're going to read about in the book of Revelation, before the end of the world, there will be seven years of the worst tribulation the world has ever seen. There's going to be a dictator who rises up. There's going to be plagues from heaven. There's going to be religious uh, oppression and people getting their heads chopped off. And then Christ will come and and wipe out the Antichrist and all the rest of it. But that's the tribulation. We believe that that rapture that I just talked about will happen before that. There's some that believe it'll happen in the middle. Some believe it'll happen at the end, as you might imagine, right? Now, why do we believe this here? Why do we believe that this rapture, this catching away, and maybe you've seen the Left Behind movie, you've read the books, that, that's an example of pre-trib. Not everybody believes it's going to happen quite that way with your fillings falling out on the airplane and stuff like that. But here's a couple reasons why we believe this. And I've gone through all of these in detail before in the book of Thessalonians, uh, in Daniel a little bit, but let's do this again. Number one, why before the tribulation? Because we do not believe we are appointed to wrath as Christians. First Thessalonians tells us we are not appointed to wrath, meaning there's no more wrath of God left for you. Now, every Christian believes that, right? Because where did the wrath of God get poured out for the Christian? On Jesus, on the cross, Right? That was the wrath of God poured out for sin. Now, here's the issue. The tribulation, as we're going to describe, is the wrath of God poured out on the world. 
It's the end times. It's God's way of saying, this is the judgment for everybody who's left. So we have a soteriological, which means a salvation problem, with Christians enduring that. Because it's not just another hard time, nor is it just the wrath of the devil. It's the wrath of the Lamb, Revelation 6 is going to say. So we don't believe we're appointed to that. That it's, it is not possible for us to endure the wrath of God even a little bit, because Jesus took it all on the cross. Number two, something that is called the desolation of Israel. And this is a deep one. I don't have time to get into it so much. Listen to some of our old Palm Sunday messages. That's kind of the week we talk about that. But when Israel rejected Jesus as their Messiah, on Palm Sunday, Jesus said, Your house is left to you desolate, and you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus said, You rejected me as your Messiah. So your house is going to be left desolate, meaning Israel, the Jews, are going to be ravaged for the rest of history until they call me their Messiah. Paul tells us in Romans 11 that all the Jews have had their hearts partially hardened, like Pharaoh had his heart hardened in the book of Exodus. So Jews can get saved, and there are some in this church who have gotten saved, but there will be no national revival of them until Christ returns. That is part of the judgment that is poured out on them. So Part of the reason that we believe in a pre-trib rapture is because the Lord has said in several places, Israel is on pause while I deal with these Gentiles, my Gentile church. And when that time is complete, I will return to my, my people. Daniel and the 70 weeks come involved in that. You can go listen to that study if you like. So we're not appointed to wrath. There's something going on between Israel and the Gentiles here. Number three is imminence. If something's imminent, it can happen at any moment, right? There's nothing that has to happen before it happens. Doesn't mean that it's going to happen today or even soon. It means there's nothing else that has to happen until it happens. And that's what we believe about the rapture. Because if you read throughout the Bible, especially the New Testament, kind of only the New Testament, I guess, when they talk about the return of the Lord, they talk about it like something that is going to catch everybody by surprise, happen suddenly, and only the Christians that are looking and waiting for it will be ready. Now, we're going to read throughout the book of Revelation all manner of prophetic things that must be fulfilled before Christ comes in his, what's called his second coming. So if you believe that all of these things have to happen first, you cannot legitimately join with the Bible and say that the rapture is imminent. You're not really looking prophetically then for the return of Christ next. You're looking for the abomination of desolation. You're looking for the Antichrist. And some people can really make an awful lot out of that and really make a bunch of post-trib people angry and say, you're looking for the Antichrist. You're not looking for Jesus. Well, I agree with that, but I don't want to be mean about it. Just, you know, because that's not what they're looking for, you know. But we believe that this can happen at any moment. And I think if you don't hold to a pre-trib rapture view of the, of the end times, I don't know if you can say that the return of Jesus is imminent and could happen at any moment, which is how the Bible describes it. It also, by the way, just a little side note here, is why we do not need to waste our time looking for a bunch of signs of the rapture. The only thing that needed to happen for Jesus to return was for Jesus to ascend, right? Jesus said, I'm coming quickly. They, they stood there on the mountain waiting for Jesus. And the angels had to be like, shoo, you know, go, go, go preach the gospel to some people. The Lord knows when, we don't. Nothing has to happen. The temple doesn't have to be built. There doesn't have to be an antichrist. There doesn't have to be the fall of the United States. None of these things have to happen before the rapture because it's imminent. And number four, and this comes from the book of 2 Thessalonians, the removal of the restrainer. Here's what some, some uh, it's called post-millennial, people who believe that they're not really going to be a tribulation. It's just going to get better and better until Jesus comes back. Some uh, Pentecostal groups fall into this category. Um, they say, well, wait a minute, you believe in the, the tribulation, that there's going to be a time where the church is defeated and ground into the dust. Didn't Jesus say that would never happen? Didn't Jesus say the gates of hell would never prevail against my church? How can you say that? Well, if you believe in the rapture like we do, you say that isn't going to happen. In fact, Satan can't do anything until God gets his church out of here. Because Second Thessalonians explains that Satan and the mystery of lawlessness, which in that passage refers to the Antichrist, he said that cannot happen until the restrainer is removed. And the question becomes, well, what is the restrainer? Without getting into that passage in detail, we believe it is the work of the Holy Spirit through the church. 
which should put a little smile on your face because as terrible as things get, as long as God's people are on the world, Satan is on a leash. Amen? So that's why. You can go listen to the study in 2 Thessalonians on that. So we're not appointed to wrath, and that's what the tribulation is. We believe that there is a, there's a distinction between the church and Israel, and Israel is desolate right now. Number three, we believe in the imminence of the return of Jesus. And number four, the removal of the restrainer has to happen first. And I've never, by the way, yet heard somebody who is not pre-trib be able to answer what the restrainer is to my satisfaction. I'm sure they're out there. I just haven't heard it, and I'm pretty well read on this subject. So with all those four things, those are the main ones. But if verse 1 of Revelation 4 should never be used as a primary argument for the pre-trib rapture. But if you believe in all those things I just said, this sure fits in. Because it's not saying that there will be a rapture at this time. Even John Walverd, who is like the, the king of the pre-trib guys, is like, uh, don't push this one. But I'm going to push it a little bit here. Because what do you have? He's describing the things that are, the things that are right now, the seven churches. And immediately after that, what does he hear? He hears the voice of a trumpet saying, come up here. That's what the rapture is. That's a description of the rapture, even if it's not what he's referring to specifically here. And I believe in the following verses, you're going to see God's people in heaven. So that's why I think when he says, come up here, and he's got a voice speaking like a trumpet, he's talking about that rapture. That when the church age ends, when all the, the Ephesian church, the Laodicean church, the Sardinian church, the American church, when they've reached their end point, a voice like a trumpet is going to open a door in heaven and say, come up here. That's pretty cool, isn't it? So can I just ask you, are you ready for that? Are you ready for the return of Jesus? Crystal Lewis wrote a song called People Get Ready. Jesus is coming. Still gets me excited, even though I've been hearing it since I was a little kid in a cassette tape in my mom's minivan growing up. If Jesus were to come today, would he come for you? Just ask that question, even if you're not sure about the theology of it. If Jesus were to return today, would you be with those saints when they go marching in? However you interpret this verse, we all believe that Jesus is coming back. And however we differ on the details of that is less important than if you will be ready when the day comes. And John is invited into heaven to see what's going to happen at the end. Well, we're not going to go through every verse that slow, but I thought that was important. So let's get to verse 2, and we'll jump down to verse 8 as well. At once I was in the spirit, in the twinkling of an eye, you might say, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. And around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their head. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings, literally their voices, and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. John is in the Spirit immediately. You know, I hope, what it means to be in the Spirit you read the book of Acts, people did all kinds of things in the Spirit. Ezekiel talks about being in the Spirit when he had his visions. David wrote in the Spirit, the Bible says. It's a description of communion with the Holy Spirit and of, of walking in tight fellowship with the Spirit, which happens at certain times. And I hope you've experienced that. It's a wonderful thing. And I, I even believe that what John's describing, this kind of ecstatic experience, which is a biblical word, by the way, ecstasy, ecstatic, is something that is good and should not be shunned and avoided if it's legitimate and real. But I think this is probably the most extraordinary version of that. He's granted a vision of the throne room of God. How'd you like that? Come on up here. Okay, and you walk in and there's God on his throne. This is the third time in the Bible we have a description of God's throne room. And 
This is so cool to me. Each time we have a description of God's throne, it is described the same way by three different people across centuries of time, but they all view it from different perspectives, meaning like literally like where they are on the, in uh, their location, and they, they all describe it the same way. So I'm going to read these to you because I, I think it's so cool that this isn't just symbolic language that John invented He saw this just like Ezekiel saw it, just like Moses saw it. So let's read these. Exodus 24, verses 9 through 11. He says, then this is at Mount Sinai where God has descended on the mountain in fire. Okay. Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel went up and they saw the God of Israel. I thought nobody saw God. Well, listen to how they saw him. They were, there was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness, the sea of glass. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God and ate and drank. So you see Moses and Aaron and the elders of Israel, they are having a view of the throne of God from beneath it. That it's like a sapphire stone, and there's the Lord seated on it. And they don't give any other description of him, but they saw where he was. Ezekiel 1, 13. And I'm actually going to just read a couple verses from this chapter. It's incredibly detailed and really cool, especially if you're artistic. I'd love to see a picture of this. But Ezekiel 1, I'm going to read 13, 22, and 26. As for the likeness of the living creatures... Their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches moving to and fro among the living creatures. The fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. Over the heads of the living creatures, there was the likeness of an expanse, shining like awe-inspiring crystal spread out above their heads. And above the expanse, over their heads, there was the likeness of a throne, in appearance like sapphire, and seated above the likeness of a throne was a likeness with a human appearance. All three of these passages are describing the same thing. Moses was standing under it. Ezekiel was viewing it from a distance, and John is up there on top of it, right in front of the throne. And there are common elements in each one of these. First of all, they all describe fire and lightning and voices and trumpets and all kinds of things like that. On Mount Sinai, I mean, the whole mountain was on fire. You know, you have the movie, and it's, it's cute in the movie, but the mountain was on fire. It was terrible, terrible, like a burning tornado settling on top of this mountain. And they went up into it. Ezekiel says that these, these living creatures, whenever they moved, it was like fire. It was like lightning. And he also describes the crackling sound, and that when they flapped their wings, it was like thunder. So it was loud and bright and noisy. And then, of course, John, he says, from the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder and the, the seven torches, right, that represent the Holy Spirit. That's the first thing, fire and lightning. So in God's presence, like, it's not, it's not some regal throne room. Like, it's, it's popping in there. Number two, number two, there is a clear expanse beneath the throne. They described, right, John called it a sea of glass. Ezekiel said that it was like crystal. And in fact, that word for crystal, both in Greek and Hebrew, can be translated ice. So that's kind of cool. Moses said that it was blue, like a sapphire stone. Now here's where it gets kind of fun. So why do they see it as clear, but Moses sees it as blue? Well, remember, Ezekiel saw the throne and said the throne was like a sapphire. Moses is standing underneath it. So if you've got a clear, crystalline surface, and there's a bright, shining blue sapphire on top of it, what color is it going to look? It's going to look blue. So again, these are not just symbolic. This is what these men saw, and they saw the same thing. So you've got this clear expanse. And I imagine for John standing on it, it probably looked like he was standing on nothing. Maybe he saw the, the stars laid out before him, and he's like in, in space. Who knows, right? He doesn't tell us, but he said it was clear. They all emphasize the clearness of it, don't they? Transparent. Almost like, am I standing on anything? Pretty cool to think about, huh? Number three, they all describe the Lord seated above it. Moses said all we saw was his feet. And I would imagine they didn't want to look in his face because Moses had already been warned about that, hadn't he? Don't look at me. There's the Lord seated on it. The throne is described as like a, like a sapphire. Ezekiel says it's a shape like a man. And John just compares his appearance to various gemstones, which we're going to look at in a, in a minute. So the Lord is seated there. And number four, Moses didn't describe these, but he, he kind of did. I'll get to it in a second. These living creatures. What a fun word that is. 
Uh, living things. Were they angels? Well, yes, but he calls them creatures, living things. They're, they're just something he'd never seen before. And Ezekiel describes them in motion. And he says that there are these angels with the wings and, and the faces. He doesn't describe the faces, but um, Isaiah did. Or who does? One of them does. I think it's Ezekiel. But in any case, he sees them. And he also says next to them are these wheels within wheels. And the, the wheels have eyes. And he says the spirit of the angels were in the wheels. I don't quite know what that means. But that's pretty cool to think about, isn't it? That apparently these things function as the wheels of God's chariot. So he describes it that way. John describes them as having these, these faces. Yeah, Ezekiel does describe it. I'm remembering now. But they had four faces, one on each side. So that's pretty wild, isn't it? Moses does not describe these living creatures. But what does he describe? The mountain burning and on fire, which is where a lot of the fire seems to come from, according to Ezekiel. And remember, the chariot's not moving at Mount Sinai. It's settled. So you, I would imagine they're either up there with the Lord or they're actually down on the mountain, and that's part of what's causing it to be engulfed in flame. This tells us that each of them saw the Lord as he exists in heaven right now. You can also read about this in Ezekiel 10. You can read about it in Isaiah chapter 6. Those are lesser passages, I think. But I just want to remind you guys, this is real. Not just making stuff up. Uh, I guess there's glass up there and fire, maybe. They're all describing the same thing from different perspectives. And John, this will preach on its own, had the clearest view. He was up there looking upon the Lord. Why? Because the blood of Jesus has given the Christian access to stand before the throne of God without being consumed by it. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, praise the Lord. Moses had the law. So he caught a glimpse, but there's always that veil. That the veil of the temple, which was blue, represented that blue expanse beneath the Lord. There's always separation. And Ezekiel could see the Lord from a distance. Just don't get too close. But John is right up there looking upon the Lord. That's so wonderful. That's what Jesus has bought for you and me. So let's, now that we know what we're looking at here, let's just go through some of these details. The Lord is described as jasper and carnelian. Jasper is something we might call a diamond. It's a clear stone, so just shining white light, I guess, just the, what you think of when you think of something shining bright. And then carnelian is a red stone, a sardius stone is another name for it. So when he sees the Lord, he sees diamond light and carnelian red light shining. That's the Lord. Now around the throne is a rainbow like an emerald, so it's a green rainbow. And the question becomes, what exactly about this is rainbow-like? And it seems to me that it's not that there's, you know, seven different colors of green. I don't think that's what he's getting at. I think it's a, there's like a, a bow. It's like a halo effect, right? Surrounding the Lord, and it's green. So the Lord shines white and red, and there's a green halo, Christmas colors. So the next time somebody wants to give you a hard time about celebrating Christmas, you just take them right back to this passage here. I don't think there's any theological significance to that, by the way. I just think it's interesting. <laughs> Helps you picture it a little bit. Then we see these 24 elders. And they're seated before the throne and around the throne. And I, I would imagine this, this is to give the indication of a council. The Bible talks often about the, the heavenly council that the Lord has of angels. And we kind of participate in the Lord's council now as we pray and intercede for people. And so you have these standing before the Lord. Now, the identity of who these 24 elders are is disputed. And this is going to be like the whole rest of the book of Revelation. So I hope you like this stuff because we're going to be trying to figure out what the symbols are. Number one, are these symbolic only? Meaning it doesn't mean anything. It just means there's a council because God's a king and kings have councils. All right, that's one possibility. Number two, that these are angels. God, like I said, Old Testament talks an awful lot about the heavenly angelic council. So perhaps that's what this is. Number three is that these are human, which is pretty much the only option left to us. And I think that that's the best option here. Because John, in the book of Revelation, as we've seen, is pretty quick to identify angels. That's an angel. I saw a big old angel. I saw an angel that looked like this. I saw a demon that looked like this. Those are living creatures, and here's elders. And they're described, as far as we can tell, as humans. So then, who are these people? Who are these people? I think it's pretty clear that these represent God's people. You have 12 and 12, 24. I would say 
that this represents the Old Testament and the New Testament saints that constitute the people of God. The Old Testament saints and the church. Twelve tribes of Israel, twelve apostles, twelve and twelve. The Lord has brought together Jews and Gentiles together in heaven. And if you believe, as I do, that verse 1 refers to the rapture, there's just another log on the fire. That John goes into heaven, and there's all the people of God standing before the Lord, represented by these 12 tribes and these 12 apostles. Now the question becomes, well, John's one of those 12, so why isn't he seated? I don't think it necessarily needs to be Peter, John, Matthias, Bartholomew in order to represent these things. For example, is Reuben going to be in heaven? I sure don't know. He was a wild dude. But somebody representing the tribe of Reuben would be, right? Why do I believe these describe God's people, Christians? And if you were an Old Testament saint with that anticipatory faith, looking forward to the Messiah, the Bible tells us that Jesus came and proclaimed the gospel to them in the grave. And you better believe that David would have fallen on on his face before Jesus when he saw him come, wouldn't he? Abraham... And even, I believe, those faithful people that were outside of the land of Israel, that had enough faith, according to the light given to them, to look for God and look for his Messiah. Well, how, do I, how are they described? Look at this. They're on thrones. They're on thrones. Revelation 3.21, he said, Those who overcome, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I sat with my father on his throne. They're wearing white, which represents righteousness, which can only come through the blood of Jesus being shed for you. Back in chapter 3, verse 5, he says, The one who overcomes, I will clothe him in white. And they're wearing crowns. In chapter 2, verse 10, and chapter 3, verse 11, he references the crown that will be given to the Christian who overcomes. These 24 elders represent everyone Christ has redeemed up to this point, Jews and Gentiles both. This is the fullness of the capital C church brought together before the Lord here. And one more reason why I believe that the church is not present during the Great Tribulation, you will not find the word church in the book of Revelation again. It's not all the time in chapter 2 and 3. So it's not that John doesn't know it or won't use it. Every time he describes those during the Tribulation who believe on the Lord, he uses different words. Because I believe that the church, as we would think of it, is a distinct historical entity that will be caught up into heaven before the Lord begins to judge the world, represented by these 24 elders. So you've got this glorious scene, the Lord on his throne, 24 elders, but it's not a peaceful scene. Don't you like that? God God is, his ways, the Bible says, are in thundercloud and smoke. And that's what we have here up in heaven. There's a loud storm raging from the throne of God the Father. He's just sitting on a storm because wherever he goes, even this heaven that he's made can barely contain him. Isn't that awesome? And there's the Holy Spirit before the throne. He's described as seven torches of fire. Think of the menorah, right? The seven lamps, which are the seven spirits of God. We've already explained this. There are not seven Holy Spirits. These seven represent the one Holy Spirit. Zechariah chapter 4, when he saw the golden lamp stand in in the tabernacle, and not by might, not by power, but by my spirit says the Lord. We talked about that in chapter 1 if you want more information, but next chapter we'll introduce the Lamb, Christ Jesus, which gives us in chapter 4 and 5 a full, awesome, Trinitarian picture of God. God the Father on his throne, the seven spirits of God before him, and the Lamb as though he were slain, Christ Jesus. The fullness of Revelation shows God in his threeness as well as in his oneness. The Trinity is an essential doctrine of the church. And once you accept that, it's everywhere. Because that's who God is. There's the sea of glass. The same expanse that was spoken of by Moses and Ezekiel. Transparent from above. But from below, it would have looked blue. And then you get these four living creatures. They're seen elsewhere in Scripture. There's slight variation in what they look like. Isaiah mentions that they had six wings and no face, and calls them seraphim, which means burning ones. Ezekiel chapter 4 describes, or sorry, Ezekiel chapter 1 describes them having four wings and four faces. John describes them having six wings and seems to say one face, although I think you can get past that. Ezekiel says that they were like a cherub, like cherubim. So there's a whole discussion in angelology over how exactly to categorize these things. 
uh, you know, like we have to categorize every salamander and every newt in the world. We want to know what it is, right? Well, I think you can just sit back and marvel a little bit. There are these things with six wings. Mentions in the Bible, they cover their face, they cover their feet, and they fly with the other two. That they're humble before the Lord. And that they're like these four different creatures. Ezekiel says there's one face on each side of their head. John doesn't mention that, but he does say that they're full of eyes all around. So maybe that's what he meant by there's eyes all every, on every side. And it's a lot of fun to sit here and wonder, what do these four animals represent? It could just be that that's the way God liked it. And he says, I really liked the way I made eagles, and I liked the way I made oxen, and I thought I'd make an angel that had a piece of all of those. But there are some that say these refer to the four Gospels. I don't know if you can push that, but I don't have a problem with it so much. And that just as the four Gospels correspond to an aspect of who Jesus is, each of these faces correspond to an aspect of who Jesus is. The lion is the king, right? The king of beasts. Matthew describes Jesus as the king of the Jews. The ox is the servant of man, the humble one, right? That's how Mark describes Jesus, as the servant of God. Man, Jesus Christ, was the son of man, which is how the Gospel of Luke describes him. The eagle is a picture throughout the Bible and and history, in every culture, of deity. And that's how John describes Jesus, as the son of God. And I think that'll preach. I don't know if you can push it so hard, but it is pretty cool to think about. And I will mention, too, I did a whole Bible study on this when we were going through Exodus. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 5 tells us that the tabernacle and the temple were a picture of God's throne room in heaven. That they were following the divine blueprint given to Moses. And I think the more you break this down, you can see exactly that. Just as in the holy place was the Ark of the Covenant with the the carvings of the angels all around. That's how you see the throne of the Lord surrounded by these angels, right? And then there was that, the veil of the temple, the expanse, that blue expanse. Then in the holy place, outside of the holy of holies, you had the lampstand, which here we have that seven, uh, seven flames representing the Holy Spirit of God. And then on the outside, you had the, uh, you had the place where the people would come and worship. And that's where we have these elders. It, it's really a very fun study to do. I don't have time to do it again today, but Exodus 24, we looked at it in detail. Go check that out. But impressive as these creatures are, and as impressive as this whole scene is, what impresses these living creatures is the Lord on his throne. And this is the danger when you study heaven, to spend all your time trying to figure out what the heads represent, instead of the thing that causes those creatures to shout before the Lord day and night. They exist ever to worship the Lord, crying out, Holy, holy, holy. There's, again, You don't want to push it, but if you believe in the Trinity, that sure makes an awful lot of sense that they're shouting three times. The Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Holy is the Father. Holy is the Son. Holy is the Spirit. What does that word holy mean? It means to be separate from everything else. That's why we usually mean it to mean moral, right? Separated from immorality. But it's bigger than that. It's separate and not like everything else. Just as God was and is and is to come. Another threefold worship there, by the way. God was and is and is to come. Who else is like that? Exodus 3.14, what did God say to Moses? I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. When God got a chance to name himself, he named himself I am who was and is and is to come. It's a reference back to the name of God. That's where it's transliterated as Jehovah or Yahweh. It's that that word, I am. Creation is glorious, but creation is just the work of God's hands. God has always been. God did not exist floating in space until he decided to create the world. There was no space for him to float in. God was. With a capital W-A-S. He was. And now he is. And guess what? He always will be. And that's what makes him holy. That attribute of God, that self-existence is called aseity. A-S-E-I-T-Y. Aseity. The self-existence of God. And that is what causes all of heaven to worship the Lord. This picture of heaven, it's good for you to carry it in your mind as you go about your day. Because you are just a breath away from standing there. Whether that's the rapture, whether that's a heart attack or a car accident, you have no idea. We are a breath away. Keep it in mind. Verse 9. 
And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. It says, whenever they cry out. Now, earlier we read they never cease. And I've heard a ton of messages preached on all they do all day long is holy, holy, and never stop. I think that's, that's true. But it seems based on this passage by saying whenever in verse 9, that like there are appointed times of worship in heaven, and they never miss one. You know, we like to make fun of monks a lot, but one thing they did really good is they had hours of the day where the bells rang, and it didn't matter what you were doing. You get on your knees and you pray, and you worship to the Lord. And this seems to be what happens in heaven too. And whenever they do that, these 24 elders worship. The only thing, you know, as, as important as the Sabbath is in the Bible, they never rest every day. When the announcement comes, glory and honor are given to the one who's on the throne. And the elders take off their own crowns. And that word is not diadem, like royalty. It's stephanos, like victory, their victor's crowns and throw them at the feet of the Lord and fall off of their own thrones and prostrate themselves before God. Hey, man, as glorious as our own exaltation is going to be, clothed in white, crowned, seated in God's presence, we will always pale in comparison to God himself. It, people want to sometimes say, don't talk so much about glorification because then people will think that they're going to be God. You will never be God. God could exalt you to be like the greatest, highest angel in all of existence, and you still would be a creature living at the mercy of the one who was and is and will be. Which is amazing, because that tells us, because God will never be threatened by you, the exaltation promised to you can be so splendid and magnificent that you have an awful lot of hope for what the future is going to be. God is worthy I had to explain this to my sons the other day. What does worthy mean? He deserves it. To be worthy of something is to deserve something. So what does God deserve? Glory. What is glory? Man, picture somebody hitting the last minute, last second game winning shot in game seven of the NBA finals. And he stands in the middle of the court and everybody picks him up and carries him around and the audience is <sighs> shouting glory. The conqueror riding back into Rome where there would be people shouting in the streets and throwing flowers in the air and captives going before him. And there he stands, glory. It means celebration. It means renown. And who deserves more glory than the Lord? Honor. You know what honor means. It means respect and obedience. So it's not just that God is great and we should celebrate him. We bow before him and say, what do you need from me? Oh, Lord, he's not just the, I mean, you, you can have people that are glorious, but are not honorable, can't you? You can have kings that win all kinds of battles and you find out what they do and you're like, I wish I hadn't learned that. Or you hear about your favorite sports hero or whatever the case may be, your favorite artist, and you find out, oh, well, they might do some glorious stuff, but they're certainly not an honorable person. God is both. Isn't that great? Number three, power. Now, this has always tripped me up, but I think I finally got it. How do you give power to the Lord? What am I going to give, right? What am I going to give to the Lord? That's probably an appropriate place to start your worship. But I want you to think of like kings bringing tribute to a higher king. Our power is at your disposal. You are the emperor, therefore all of my armies may be used as if they were yours. All of the treasure of our kingdom is at your disposal. You can use it. That's what it means to bring power to the Lord. Everything in your life that you can do, that you can offer, all of your resources, all of your skills, all of your talents, bring them before God and say, I don't got a lot of power, but here it is. You can have it. Glory and honor and power. He deserves it. He's worthy of it. That's what worship means, by the way. You want to go back and do some old English etymology? Worthyship. To offer worship is to declare that somebody is worthy of something, that they deserve something. And why does God deserve such things? They say, because you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Because God made everything. 
As you already said, God exists eternally in his aseity. He is alone by himself in his trinity. And everything else was made by him. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So many Christians are trying to move away, even creationists, from the idea that God made the world out of nothing. I don't know how you can arrive at that if you know your Bible. Well, God has always been there, but so has the universe. No, it hasn't. All things by your will existed and created. God is not a part of nature. God is not just the first cause. I mean, he is, but he's more than that. You can't sit there and mathematize God, because the minute you do, he'll do a miracle and throw everything all off. And the world also is not just an offshoot of his nature. That's a Gnostic idea. That God is so glorious that universes just kind of spin off of him. That's a Hindu idea. That when the gods dream, new worlds come into existence. You see this in science fiction sometimes, that the gods just sort of vomit up new universes every now and then. That's not how it works with the Lord. By his will, they exist. God didn't turn around and say, oops, there goes another one. He said, let there be light. And there was light. That's our Lord. Jehovah God is worthy of worship, not just because of his blessings and his favor. We'll talk about that next time. But because of who he is, the eternal, all existing, all creating, triune God. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord, said the psalmist. Psalm 150, verse 6, the last verse of the Psalms. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's that Hebrew word. Hallelujah. Means praise the Lord. Aren't we small, foolish, silly little people when we withhold worship from God because we're not getting our preferences met? Jasper and Carnelian again, huh? You know, this all seems a little much. I prefer a much more humble, intimate setting to worship my God. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'll worship, but I'm just going to, you know. Well, we'd never do that in heaven. Yeah, but we do it here, don't we? I hate this song. (laughs) The song's about Jesus, but I don't like it. This seems like a good time for me to go get some coffee. It'll only last a few more minutes. Oh, this style just really doesn't do anything for me. I miss the days when it was just Tyler on his guitar. Why do we got to have drums and bass now? It was not worship before, and I'll just show up late. Or in a few years, when the Lord blesses us, and we're an enormous megachurch. We'll see. You know, and we've we've got a big stage, and we've got guitars and drums and and fancy lights and all the rest. Well, that's not real worship anymore. Really? Because there's thunder and lightning and an emerald halo in heaven. So it's still pathetic compared to God. What am I trying to get at? Your preferences don't matter. Just, they just don't have them. But when it comes time to worship, you ball them up and throw them in the garbage because God is worthy of worship. Did you notice that these elders don't need any warm-up to start praising God? Yeah. Holy, 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 boom, down go the crowns, down they go worshiping the Lord. Why do we feel so, such a need to have like a runway for worship sometimes? I know, I just I need a little warm-up and maybe by the third song I'll be ready to go. Shame on us. The elders fall at his feet. You should walk through the door with a heart ready to praise. Ready to praise. Well, I don't know the song. First of all, the words are right there, okay? (laughs) Second of all, who cares? You know how to worship the Lord. Listen to it. Be, be, Be edified by it. Open your Bible and read it. Grab somebody next to you and say, let's pray to the Lord. Let's do what we need to do to get my heart in the right place. Rather than saying, come on, Jason. Come on, Jacob. I'm not feeling it yet. I really want to worship, but this is on you. It's not on them. It's on you. Because Jesus has already done everything he needs to do. And they work real hard to make sure that it is as easy and wonderful as possible. And they do a great job. You know, next week, we're going to see Jesus in heaven. Same scene, but a different picture. The lamb who was slain. And we're going to talk about praising God for salvation and for helping us in our hard times and everything. But for now... What chapter 4 teaches us, you worship God because he deserves it. It doesn't matter if he hasn't come through. It doesn't matter if you prayed for 10 things and none of them came to pass. He's God and he's worthy of your worship. But what a glorious picture this is, huh? Heaven. You get to see what heaven looks like. And you know what? There's going to be a new heaven. 
If you die before Jesus returns, you're going to get to see the old and the new heaven. And maybe we'll be griping to our kids and saying, this heaven is nothing like the old heaven. You should have seen that. <laughs> Those were the days, you know. <laughs> but you know what's so wonderful about this? Everything is in its proper place in Revelation chapter 4. You have the Lord on his throne, where he belongs, as if you're going to get him off, right? You've got the, the, I believe, the people of God, the Old Testament and New Testament saints, seated in splendor as we are before him, and yet falling on their face at the appointed hour. The Holy Spirit in their midst, communicating the glory of the Lord to us. And the angels that surround the throne. There's a lot more there. We haven't talked about them yet. But these living creatures, that the only job they have is either to be the wheels of God's chariot or to announce it's time for worship in heaven. And y'all, they're fine with that. Don't you love that? What, what do I do? Your job is to stand there and, and at the periodic time announce that I'm holy. Oh God, I'm not worthy of such a thing. And we're all like, I've been serving on the greeting team for a long time. I need to shake it up a little bit. What, is God less worthy now than when you started? John's going to see visions of the end of days, terrible plagues, and despicable things. Some of these pictures are going to be equally vivid, and yet they're going to be grotesque to discuss. But all of that is framed by the eternal sovereignty of the King of Heaven. Undefeated, untied, undisputed King of Heaven. And the best part is, we're going to get to spend forever in his presence. Forever. And you can taste it even right now, because the, the seven spirits of God, that Holy Spirit, dwells within you if you are in Christ Jesus. And he makes your heart to be a living, breathing, walking, holy place. And when you come to worship God, it doesn't ultimately matter whether you are there physically or just spiritually, because what makes heaven wonderful is already true for you. It's just going to be more of it when we get there. And I'll say again, do you realize that only the thinnest little veil separates you from standing before God? It could be today. Who knows? Things happen every day, positive and negative. The Lord could return, or one of us could meet our end even today, and you'll be standing before God. You know, there's... Uh, and there's a business book I read one time, and it was talking about making sure that your business is not, is not susceptible to rapid changes, right? He's like, you think everything is fine, and you're, you're prepared for all the normal stuff, but are you ready for the abnormal thing that will happen? I'll shake everything up. That's kind of what our lives are like. I'm ready for all the normal life stuff, but you do realize that you could die at any moment, and if you do, you better have it ready to go. You better have put your faith in Christ Jesus. There's no other application for us today other than to meditate the worth of God to receive your praise and worship and to let go of any selfish roadblocks that get in your way. I love that we can laugh at how silly we are about worship sometimes because we've got to remember that we're a little silly. And that has nothing to do with modern worship. It's been that way since the beginning of time. They didn't even want songs in the church at first. Then they didn't want harmonies and then they didn't want pianos and now they don't want, I don't know, pick your thing. It all amounts to that God is worth all of this. You've been invited by Jesus Christ to stand before the Lord forever. That you won't be looking at from a distance. You won't be looking up. You'll be right there before his face. So take your place and let your life resound with the praise of Almighty God.